Hello and welcome to The Gun Blog. I am Nicholas Johnson. Joining me today is a special guest, Wes Winkle. He's the president of the Canadian Sporting Arms and Ammunition Association, which is the trade association for Canada's firearm and ammunition industry. He's also the owner of Elwood Epps Sporting Goods, which was founded in 1934, has been in his family since 1995, and he's been the sole owner for eight years. And it is one of Canada's biggest independent gun stores. Wes, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to my first interview of 2022. Well, thank you very much for having me on. I appreciate it, Nicholas. And, and just the CSAAA is is an industry association. It's a little bit different than some of the than the gun owner associations. Your your members are the industry, and I, I guess the people you you want to work with is everybody from the Giants, the Canadian Tires, the North Silvas, the Big Rock Sports, the Cabela's, all the way down, I guess, to the individual gunsmith. What is the mission of, of the CSAAA? So the CSAAA was formed and the mission is to uh, to assist all of the Canadian gun industry or the shooting sports industry as a whole. So we uh, we represent manufacturers, uh, distributors and retailers, as well as gunsmiths and uh, some outfitters and some uh, outlying people and uh, in the industry. Um, the membership uh, is uh, all the people that you said, with the exception of some of the big chains, and some of the big chains have got uh, lawyers and rules that prohibit them from joining associations like ours. But otherwise, uh, pretty much the whole industry is, is under one umbrella. And uh, our mission statement is to uh, interact with government, protect the rights of the business, as well as to uh, you know try to fill in the gaps of where government doesn't come in to try to self-regulate and to keep our industry uh, you know, on the straight and narrow and in the in the right minds of public perception. Got it. Yeah. And actually, just on the website, if anybody wants to learn more, there is a, a blog post that just went up last week called Who is the CSAAA? And it outlines in more detail. And I, I think this is I'm really happy to have you here because you have that as president of the CSAAA, you have that wide countrywide uh, intel and insight from your members across the country. And you have the deep view of Elwood Epps, which is Again, it's it's uh, about an hour and a half north of Toronto. Anybody who's gone north on Highway 11 passes by this your gun store, and this little little gun store in in surface area is actually by the business that you do pretty huge, and you have years of deep experience there. So you you I'm really happy to have that you're wearing these two caps today, yeah. and we're going to cover a bunch of topics from the business and industry, what happened in 2021, and how 22 is 2022 is looking and talk about some of the politics and regulatory context, in, including the mass confiscation criminalization of May 2020, and the latest on the shipping issue with Canpar Loomis. You guys are involved in that. But first, I'd like to start with something that was just in the news um, overnight. Today is uh, February 14th, so just overnight. The theft of 2,000 firearms from a shipping truck in Peterborough. What uh, you, you have some more information on that. Yes, uh, we had some discussions this morning. Uh, so one of our uh, largest manufacturers uh, in Canada of firearms is Savage Arms. They're located in Lakefield, Ontario, just outside of Peterborough. And uh, Savage Arms is uh, uh, a division of Savage USA, which uh, uh, manufactures lots of different bolt-action rifles. And some, uh, they also import some uh, uh, shotguns as well. But in the case of uh, Savage Arms Canada, is that they, that's where they manufacture the rimfire rifles. So just the 22 um, long rifle rimfire rifles. And uh, this was a shipment that was outgoing from Savage Arms Canada uh, down to the United States to a foreign buyer. Uh, once that shipment leaves Savage Canada on a tractor trailer, that trailer goes to a shipping yard, which is standard procedure. And unfortunately, this trailer was stolen out of the shipping yard uh, by criminals. Uh, so it really, uh, as far as the theft goes, uh, the possession of these firearms at this point was not in anybody in the industry. It was in the possession of a shipping company. And unfortunately, they had a security breach. And uh, at this point in time, the firearms are missing. Uh, I can tell you that most of the firearms on the shipment are single shot bolt action 22. So not typically the firearms used in organized crime. Uh, most of them are the Savage Rascal rimfire rifles, which are designed for youth. They, uh, they're pink and blue and purple in color. Um, so I don't think that the if it is an organized crime ring that happened to get a hold of these, I don't think they're going to be too happy when they open the boxes to see their big score. 
I, I don't have any contacts with organized crime, so it's it's. But I'll take your word for it. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's funny. I'm sorry. It's it's not a funny issue, but I'm laughing here. Uh, and, and what is what is your involvement? Like, how did how did CS AAA get involved in in this type of thing? Well, because of uh, the CS AAA uh, having a uh, a long standing relationship with the government and media, when there's interactions uh, about firearms related stories. Uh, for the most part, uh, the, our standard mainstream media looks to their known principles and they always go to the same cast of characters. And uh, we are involved in that because we talk to media. So uh, I reached out to Savage Canada this morning to try to learn a little bit more so that I could walk into the interview with a little bit more knowledge on the situation. Got it. Okay. And that's, that's if any, in case any journalists are watching this, if you want to reach people in industry, you can contact me, of course, CS AAA, and I can put you in touch with uh, with uh, people across the country. Yeah. Um, anything more to say about that 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 theft that was reported by Peter Bo Police yesterday? Uh, yeah, nothing other than the, the uh, you know the the key to remember is is that uh, this was not a situation that really had industry involvement, other than the manufacturing and the legal. Uh, change of possession to a shipping company who is licensed to ship. So uh, there should be no risk to the industry as far as uh, possible uh, 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 issues with liability or anything like that. This is something that was completely uh, a standard procedure. Got it. And I think it's also, so from, from my point of view, again, I'm not, I'm not in the industry, but I talk a lot with industry and, and for people who aren't familiar with guns, like what we, what, people don't often realize is firearms are a household i'm going to you know are a household product in canada and there are millions of people who own firearms if you're not familiar with firearms you have this idea is, oh my god you know these are rare objects that are exceptional and and very few people have them but that's not the case and there's thousands 4, 4500 companies involved in the in ammunition and firearms and a couple million people who are licensed to use firearms plus millions of family and friends who we take to the range or, or who come with us and are, are participate without being licensed. And there's an incredible trade. There's 50,000 people in the industry. So there's shipping. We'll get to this in a, in a few minutes when we talk about the, uh, the business in 2021, but it's, it's a huge industry. So it's, I don't want to say that it's, well, actually it's, it's almost exceptional that this kind of stuff doesn't happen more often. Like there's so much theft and counterfeiting going on. It's, it's, that, thank goodness these stories are quite exceptional, actually. Yeah, they are. I mean, obviously, uh, the industry takes a great deal of pride in the fact that we try to make, make sure that everybody that handles firearms throughout the chain of command is a licensed and, and legal enterprise. So obviously, uh, you know, with that type of scrutiny on stuff, we, we try to make sure that this stuff can, does not happen very often. But on the flip side, you know, uh, yeah, it's, it, it, there's just uh, too much movement for it to never happen. And no situation is perfect. But uh, I do believe the industry does a great job of, of keeping firearms in the hands of legal owners. And the people, I've, the people I'm in touch with, they keep em emphasizing that they go above and beyond the minimum requirements because they know. No, first of all, nobody wants their gear to end up in the hands of the wrong people. And they understand the reputational liability, the business liability, like so, so. The, whatever the regulations are, the businesses go above and beyond those. Almost always, uh, you know, we uh, quite laugh sometimes when we interact with government because they believe that they are the conscience of the industry when actually, in fact, it, it's more the the public perception the industry is concerned about, but also uh, the scrutiny of our insurance companies. Uh, all of us operate with insurance and it is the most difficult thing for all of us to get. So when our insurance company says jump, uh, for the most part, we just say how high because we don't want to damage that relationship with our insurance company. And uh, it's very difficult to, to find insurance and to maintain it. And it's uh, very disheartening to operate without it. So yeah, our insurance companies are our biggest uh, source of scrutiny. Incredible. So it's so interesting. Anyway, I hope that that gets wound up and, and, and now we can move on to, to happier things. How was, how was business in 2021 for, I'll ask first across the industry, what have you heard from your, from your members about the year of 2021? Well, first and foremost, I want to say that uh, the consumers of Canada have been amazing. The, the demand has been has never been higher. The demand for firearms, ammunition, and almost all shooting accessories is higher than ever. Uh, the, the unfortunate part and the, the, the hardships that are being suffered are uh, uh, because of two significant factors, one of which is the lack of inventory in, in our country. 
And that is an industry wide problem that is, uh, is very far reaching. There's a lots of factors involved. Um, and then of course, second has been, uh, the government regulation, uh, which has hampered the industry, especially in the, in the, uh, facet of, uh, shooting competitions. Um, you know, the largest users in our industry are, uh, the people that do competition shooting. And because of the spacing mandates and the illegal gathering mandates, uh, a lot of the shoots have not happened for a couple of years. And that's really reduced the volume of fire that's actually happening. On the flip side, we've seen increases in the outdoor portion or the, the hunting and, and uh, sports shooting uh, recreational outdoor portion. So we've seen hunting go up, but sports shooting take a bit of a pullback because of the fact that uh, a lot of the shoots couldn't operate. Um, but that being said, the demand is there. Uh, product still flies off the shelves. It's just very difficult to get the product. Uh, our manufacturers have a, a, a large, large backlog and a large back order rate. And, um, you know, they, just in a very small example, I was on the phone with RCBS this morning and they list a little over 4,700 SKUs. And as of this morning, they had 72 SKUs in stock. 72 out of 4,700. Insane. So, and that's RCBS mothership in, I guess, in the United States or that's in that's Canada? In, that's in California. That California. was in, right in California. That's yeah. incredible. So I just want to put up here the, I'm just going to put up the, um, my slide deck of showing the firearm imports last year that Stats can release, Statistics Canada released those numbers last year. And I know imports, they are what they are. They're imperfect. They're, they're, they don't indicate current business trends. There's some lag there, but it's the best available numbers that we have. And they were for 2021. That's what's where the red arrow is. That was the second highest year of firearm imports on record. You see rifles are blue there, uh, shotguns are orange, handguns are green, and at the very very top of the bar you see muzzle loaders. And and from what I'm getting from you is, if there weren't these supply constraints, the numbers would have been even higher in terms like if, if we could get the guns in that it would there would have been even more. Oh, absolutely. Uh, I could tell you that, uh, you know, on a small scale, just our store here, the firearm back order rate was just about 50%. So we only brought in half the firearms that we were trying to bring in. And I do believe that that's just a snapshot of across the country, but I believe that would be uh, universal uh, numbers you'd hear across the country. Uh, the demand is, is through the roof. Uh, you typically see that in times of uncertainty, but in, in this situation, it's been way more uh, because of the fact that a lot of your mainstream uh, recreational activities, whether they be, you know, anything from concerts to holidays in at uh, destination resorts, or whether it even be something simple as sporting events, um, they just haven't existed. So people are looking to spend their uh, recreational dollars at, at solo activities, and and hunting is and shooting is one of those solo activities that a lot of rural people can do at home. So the demand has been quite high. That's I just find that extraordinary that the numbers are really through the roof. I had. Um... Uh, uh, Spiros Chriso, who of, of Beretta Group Canada, Stoger Canada, on a couple of months ago, and he he didn't use the same words as you, but he echoed that sentiment. Business was fantastic, and he said the the feedback he's getting from dealers for this year, 2022, is is also like basically it's the trend is continuing. Um, it is a little bit of a dis, uh, a, a bit of a concern, and that is on the ammunition front, right? The ammunition is uh, is in short supply, and the price of it has gone up significantly. And that's causing uh, a bit of a pullback now for some of the consumers. Uh, just concerned about the overall overall affordability of our sport. That's really. And is there any? I know you said there's that there's that mix between the sport shooters and the hunters and and COVID affecting assembling in that way. But is there any concern? I knew early in the pandemic, people were telling me that there was a lot of interest in what I'm going to call home defense firearms people got panicked about economic collapse and and mass unemployment and rising crime is that trend still going on or is that over it's pretty much over you're still seeing a little bit of it i mean there the there's always that um i hate using the term now because our our leadership in canada is demonized so much but there's that fringe element that uh of people that are uh you know, preppers or, or stockpilers, there's always going to be that exist. Uh, but we've seen, uh, you know, at the start of the pandemic, there was a bit of that going on with no question. But we've seen that dissipate fairly quickly. And now it seems to be, again, most people are buying what they use. Interesting. And, and you give a mix between hunting and, and sporting. Is there anything you can say about the types of products that that are hot or that, are, that you're seeing are hot either last year or, or currently? Yeah, we're seeing a, a large trends uh, in in sales towards shotgunning. Uh, we're see, you know we've seen a lot more people get involved in shotgunning, uh, both on the on the sports shooting and 
on the um, hunting side. And I think the sports shooting side is because that's primarily an outdoor activity at most ranges, whereas you know, some of the handgun stuff is an indoor activity. And again, there's so many constraints on indoor activities. Uh, the other thing is we're seeing a, a large increase in rimfire activity. Uh, 22 rimfire sales are, are up dramatically. And I think that is uh, because we got a lot of youth coming back into our sport. A lot of parents are introducing their children to it again, because they have them at home more and they're, they're more outdoors. But the second thing is, is that rimfire is the least expensive ammunition in our industry to shoot. So we're seeing a large increase in, in rimfire uh, uh, interest, um, you know, especially on the, on the competition side, uh, the, the precision rimfire uh, series and stuff have gained a lot of popularity because it's a lot less expensive to participate in. That's, that's so, okay. That's so, and would you say, is that affecting a particular type of segment? Like among your members, is that affecting everybody from the, the, the giant chains to the little mom and pop shots or is it more focused? Yeah, I think all the way from manufacturing, you're seeing manufacturers uh, take a lot more interest in trying to uh, expand their rimfire offerings. You know, you're seeing a lot of precision style rifles like Ruger and Savage and have offered a lot of precision rimfire rifles as out of the box, uh, ready to go. Instead of having to be customized and built, you're seeing a lot of turnkey ones that are ready to go. And uh, you're seeing the ammunition manufacturers uh, make ammunition specifically keyed to that sport. So yeah, you're seeing, uh, you know, I know that even to the chain stores, you know, your Cabela's and stuff like that, you've seen their rimfire offerings increase as well. It's so interesting because, again, I, I would have, I, I thought, I just assume everybody's like me, right? My dad bought me my first rifle, a Kui 22 bolt action when I was uh, like 11 or 12. or, And I just assumed that that's everybody's intro rifle and that it would be sort of more of a bread and butter product as opposed to uh, like a bread and butter every year there's there's a whole bunch of them uh, like a, a steady baseline so I, I find it really interesting to hear that there's a, a rising demand in that I'll, I'll take yeah it. And, you know it's one of those things where you're right and because we've seen more youth get involved we're seeing that bread and butter stuff go up as well but what we're seeing though is is that high end that premium rimfire rifle really gaining popularity for guys that want to be competitive in those types of shooting sports. Uh, you know, that cooey that your father gave you just unfortunately is going to be very difficult to compete in precision rimfire with, whereas, uh, you know, a Ruger precision rifle or a Savage precision rifle, which has retail value of just under a thousand dollars, uh, now has become a very large volume sale item. That's uh, okay. I, I love learning this stuff. This is why this is so good to have you here. Yeah. Um, and in terms of shotguns, there's I know there's this huge mix between the everything from a two thousand dollar Benelli or Beretta to a two hundred dollar Churchill or Canuck. Uh, what wh is there any kind of thing you can say about the mix there? Yeah, so I mean, again, with with a lot of new shooters, which we've had a, a, a good growth of new shooters coming into the sport, you're seeing that entry level stuff that uh, you know uh, Winchester pump or that Canuck pump or those you know five hundred dollar entry level shotguns uh, increase in sales. But you've also seen a bit of a trend of uh, guys also consolidating a lot of their their lower value guns and getting into higher value shotguns, uh, like some of the Italian manufacturers, Beretta, Benelli, uh, you know, some of the higher end Brownings and this and that. So you're seeing that there's a large uh, uh, influx in shotgun sales. And again, I think it's uh, primarily you've seen a lot of people that that may have focused more on some of their indoor competitions. Uh, exploring or expanding their shooting uh, repertoire to now include shotgunning or outdoor uh, sports as well. It's fascinating. Uh, and what are the, what are the, in terms of like the bread and butter, the stuff you see steady demand uh, every year after year after year, what kind of products are those? Well, your standard uh, big game hunting rifles is always a bread and butter uh, thing, you know, where you get your, your lever action 308s and your bolt action center fire rifles and your 30 sixes and your 308s. Uh, that stuff is always, um, uh, it, you know, standard uh, turnkey stuff that, that you sell all the time. Uh, you know, that, that's where a lot of your hunting demand comes from. But uh, we still do see a large, you know, we're still seeing an increase in guys that are varmint hunting and predator hunting. So you're seeing more of the 22250 and the 223 type rifles going out the door for guys that are like, you know, call coyotes and stuff like that. And so, uh, you know, there's been an increase in that in that field as well. But still, I think the volume is still seasonal on the hunting side. And you're seeing a lot of that, uh, you know, fall, big game hunting, uh, traditional stuff uh, is still uh, growing and increasing as well. Is there anything you can say about your best sellers? Like a, uh, the, what is the the default go-to 308 or 30-06 fire rifle for a Canadian hunter? Is there anything you can say? Uh... Yeah, it's, I mean, it very much splits. Our country has two very distinct uh, kind of ways of hunting. 
you're seeing a lot of uh, longer range uh, bolt action calibers in Western Canada, uh, you know, stuff that can be, that can reach out and touch and, and allow you to shoot longer ranges. So you're seeing a lot of growth and stuff like 6.5 Creedmoor and, you know, 300 PRC and some of these uh, rifles that are designed for long range shooting. Um, and then you flip the script when you get into Eastern Canada and you get into, you know, the dense bush of Ontario and Quebec and, and even parts of Manitoba where you're seeing uh, a growth and, and, firearms that can be used to uh, harvest animals on the run uh you know so you're seeing stuff like lever action sales going up dramatically we've seen a large growth on lever action guns uh semi-auto rifles another one that there's been a lot of growth in and that typically uh, tends to be more like i said an ontario quebec sort of thing so the country is quite split on what what products are popular as far as hunting goes uh depending on the type of hunting that's done uh you know very often you will see in uh the southern parts of the prairies that Almost all the hunting is exclusive stationary hunting and, and uh, sitting on tree stands or watches. And then you have a lot of hunting still in North or in uh, the Eastern part of Canada, which is fire or animals being chased around and then being shot on the run. So you're seeing a lot more of those repeat rifles uh, offered in, in Ontario and Quebec. And this is also your store. So you have customers, I guess, across the country. You're, you're, what you're telling me is based on part of it, your own personal experience of your own business. And part of it, I guess, is also from what you're hearing from your membership. Yeah, from the membership and then from my own personal experience, you know, we do a lot of uh, website sales, obviously, like, uh, you know, online part of the business is growing and growing all the time. Uh, you know, now it's over half of what we sell is online. So uh, when you when you uh, track those trends, you see that, uh, you know, uh, a lever action 3030 rifle is not a very good seller in Western Canada. You will sell a few here and there, but not very often. But that type of rifle is in high demand in Ontario and Quebec. So uh, you know, you see those trends and and uh, it makes total sense when you look at the geography of the country. And you haven't mentioned handguns. What's going on with handguns? Handguns are actually very interesting right now. The sales are up. Uh, but we are seeing an increase in sales. Um, the, there's, uh, But it's a very volatile market. You know, we're seeing a lot of turnover on handguns coming in on our use side. Uh, you know, we see a lot of... Um, uh, guns being traded in some people that are a little bit uh, uh, worried about where the government's leaning on handguns and they, they see in their papers all the time talk about handgun bans and provincial bans and municipal bans and, the, and they get a little concerned and people that maybe aren't participating in the sport anymore are concerned with having these guns at home so they want to get them sold and out in the market but on the flip side we're seeing a lot of guys that enjoy our sport and a lot of ladies enjoy our sport uh, buying more handguns because they're worried about the future supply chain issues uh, if they can't get them. So uh, handguns are still selling very well, but it's one of those things that we're also seeing an increase in people looking to dispose of them, which is uh, uh, a little bit concerning. But for the most part, it's, it's in elderly folks that are getting out of our sport. And so is that is there a concern at all like um, like the used market? So there's going to be a, a more stuff happening on the used market and that drives down demand for the new stuff? That's correct. We're seeing that uh, the used market is stronger right now in the handgun because of the amount of guns for sale. And combine that with the increased retail value because of inflation of the new guns, uh, it, it, we are seeing a bit of a pullback on the new handguns, uh, whereas uh, the used ones, the popularity is very high. So that's, I'm sure if, if you're in the, if anyone's in the market to buy handguns, I'm sure there's some opportunities to, to be had. How do you as a, or you as a, as a business owner and business in general, how do you handle when there's that type of political regulatory uncertainty? How do you manage it when, when you well, know any day the, the market could dramatically change? Yeah, it's, it's always a reality, and in, in, in especially in Canada, we've, we've been dealing with it for a long time. I mean, we've been through lots of different firearm prohibitions, and, and uh, you know, you, you can't worry about it. If you operate your business being concerned about what happens that way in the future, it'll cripple you. So you have to continue to, to plan and, and, and invest and buy firearms and inventory and, and hope that the government uh, does not bring in regulation. But um, you know, sometimes uh, you end up absorbing huge losses like we saw back, uh, you know, May 1st, uh, uh, we, when that prohibition comes in, in, into play. When you have large volumes of that inventory, that becomes a, a huge loss to your industry. And we've seen some dealers that were unable to survive that loss. And it's extremely unfortunate and, and highly unnecessary. But, uh, you know, in the political climate of Canada at this day and age, it's the reality of the beast. 
are you are you as a, as, a, as, a, as a, are you as Elwood Epps planning to change your handgun offerings because of the possible criminalization confiscation of handguns? Uh, no, we have not. We have really not changed our future plans at all. The only thing that I might say is is that uh, um, we've kind of uh, high, or, uh, ordered less valuable handguns, but that's more because of the increased retail value. Um, a lot of the guns that uh, traditionally have been bestsellers are now creeping up in value. You know, a gun that sold for $700 in uh, 2015 pretty much now is $1,400. So if you... Um, What's an you example? Know, what's an example of that type of? Uh, uh, you know, let, let, let's say for example, a Smith and Wesson forty-one twenty-two handgun. Uh, you know, we, we were always in that seven to eight hundred dollar range, and now you're seeing, like I said, that that gun sell for fourteen, fifteen hundred dollars. Uh, a lot of your revolvers, uh, but even uh, your you know your real high volume stuff like Glocks. Uh, you know, an average Glock was about six fifty in two thousand fifteen, and that that price has now gone up to eight fifty nine hundred dollars for your average gun. So there has been an increase uh, in that retail value and therefore, uh, you know, in buying and getting the store prepared, we're trying to find some least less expensive offering. Some of the stuff that's uh, necessarily import guns and that to try to, you know, try to give the opportunity for people coming into the sport to be able to afford to do it. It's interesting. And, and just, just what I've seen again from these, from these import numbers, I look at the import numbers. I'm just going to put those back up on screen every month. I, I, uh, <laughs> you're you're in your store right you, actually yeah. which which part of i've been to your store I'm, i should also disclose i'm a, i'm a customer of your store which uh let me just get you back up on screen here in in solo layout uh Ooh. which part of the store are you in right now i'm actually right at our reception area at the front and the the reason why is that i'm on my cellular phone and that of course signal is the strongest uh up there our our for those that have been here our gun room is down below grade it's in the it's in a basement area of the store and uh Cell phone signal is not always the greatest uh, dead in that part of the store. So it just again, it just shows the dedication. He, we had this appointment for this for this interview, and whatever the tech is, whatever the signal is, where he Wes is there to to deliver. Um, do you think back to the handguns? Are, is there any? Well, I believe that given the regulatory political headwinds, that there is going to there is a slow and steady decline of popularity of firearm ownership in Canada and I can imagine a situation I'm speculating here I'm going to get your I'm going to ask you the end of the question is going to be for a reality check is this is this credible or not that there will probably will always be lawful firearm owners in the country but it's going to be with certain products like maybe like what we've seen for AR15s or what we may be seeing for handguns it's going to be more of a niche more specialized if handguns are still allowed it's going to be a very small number and maybe even in general there will always be businesses serving some segment of the market but it's not going to be the mass market that we see today it's going to be pop, probably we're heading to a trend of more specialized smaller businesses serving a much smaller niche i'm talking decades down the road is that um is that realistic? It probably is realistic. I mean, obviously, we're hopeful. We, we The industry does a lot of reinvestment to try to ensure that we have that growth and we're trying to get that youth element in there. I think, um, uh, you know, one thing we've seen is that in the last couple of generations, we, we had seen quite a pullback in the outdoor activity portion of our sports and a large increase in the sports shooter or the uh, target shooter aspect. But then when COVID happened, we've seen kind of a flip again where that uh, all of a sudden that dad that might have, uh, you know, spent his two weeks vacation down in Mexico or, or, or down in Cuba. Now, all of a sudden, had two weeks to, to, to spend and didn't want to spend it at home. So took his son or daughter to the hunt camp and went, re, you know, reinvited himself with the guys and went back out into that sport. So I think that we will see uh, lots of new young shooters coming in. It's I think it's our job as a. Uh, the CSAAA, and then our job as an industry to ensure that we invest in that youth and to sponsor events and to get people involved, but also to fight uh, the onerous regulation to make sure that it's not too difficult for those people to get into our sport. Um, you know, I think one of the things that uh, the industry has recognized is that with a lot of the video games that are out there nowadays uh, and the ones that the children grow up playing is that, believe it or not, in a lot of cases, that's how they're introduced to our sport. And it's our job now to capture that that uh, interest and to bring it into the real life aspect of it and, and to try to bring them into the sports shooting and sports. So I'm hearing I'm hearing someone who's who's turning this. A lot of people talk about oh, video games bad, violence bad. Okay, but you're talking about how to change that. Okay, let's turn let's take these. Pe the reality is there are 
lots of kids playing video games. How do we turn that into a business opportunity and turn them into safe, responsible citizens who own firearms? And that's absolutely, you know, we, uh, I will get marketing information from our vendors now. And one of the things that they will mention, uh, you know, when they bring out a new firearm is that we've able to, been able to get this as the feature firearm in, in this video game or that video game. And, you know, uh, I, I, I coach a lot of youth. Uh, I, I'm pretty involved in youth sports. So I, I spend a lot of time around young men and women. And I'm telling you that we see uh, these, a lot of these children uh, will understand makes and models and actions of firearms that have never actually shot a real gun, but they know what through these video games. And inherently, by knowing this and, and learning what the different firearms are and how they work through that game, they generally get a bit of an interest for it. And when you offer the opportunity for them to use that gun in real life, they get a big smile on their face and jump at it because uh, it's something they've, they've thought about ever since they started playing the game. That's, that's amazing. And I, I, don't, I know the names of like Call of Duty, I think, is one of the, the huge, um, huge ones. I don't play video games, so I don't, it's not a domain I know. But that trend, is that... Is that kind of new or has it been going on for decades i would say a decade i think our industry was slow to acknowledge it in fact a lot of times there was a lot of resistance to it you know a lot of the older uh demographic of our of our industry doesn't like uh stuff like paintball and airsoft and and any type of time whenever you where you have a humanoid target uh in the sites a, a lot of us get queasy and uncomfortable because we grew up in a situation where we were told that you're never to do that you know uh, so whenever you see a sport or anything where there's that human element involved, uh, like I said, a lot of the older demographic is queasy about it. But uh, the nature of marketing is, is that you have to pay attention to the trends and, and first person shooter games have, uh, ha have just exploded in popularity. And if you're in an industry that has the ability to capture that and you ignore it, I think that you're doing capitalism a disservice by not uh, capturing that market. So, I think, yeah, you're seeing that the industry finally realized we got to get hop on this train because it's it's going to continue on with or without us. So we might as well uh, get on that train. And, uh, you know, uh, whether it be, um, uh, like you said, Call of Duty or some of the online games that are being played, I know that uh, uh, <laughs> in my memory, but I don't play video games either. But the, the one with the dances and you've seen a lot of kids explode into that game um, I, I, I will think of it before the end, of the <laughs> okay. but, but uh, you know, you're seeing that, that, uh, that those games have really uh, brought a lot of people to have a general interest in our sport. And it's our job to try to bring them into our sport safely and in a licensed manner. That's so interesting. And again, I, I got to, if, if you're watching this and you can help me at the gunblog.ca, write something to connect whatever call of duty or whatever other popular video game is to the, to the, purchase of actual firearms i please connect with me uh info at the gunblog.ca you're also reminding me of another aspect of the firearm i'm going to call it the firearm community which is that it's incredibly diverse and you have every all ages from the young from young children to very old, well very old people and you have people who are focused on hunting and who would never think of using their firearms for personal protection you have people like me who got into it mostly out of interest in personal protection and have never been hunting and everything in between and versus a tool like a, you live on a farm or you're you run a ranch or, or yeah olympic shooters and like everything under the sun is part of this community and we all use different variations of pretty much the same tools it's so true i mean uh, i we have a, a certain uh portrayal from the media of what a generalized gun owner looks like and it, it makes us laugh for the ones that are in the industry and deal with the, the demographic every day because you're absolutely right it's an extremely diverse crowd uh um you know uh and you, you're right a lot of times the tools overlap but at the same time the specialty part of the of the industry is so vast uh you know i have a lot of people i sit down in a job interview and i ask them what their firearms knowledge is on a scale of one to ten and i'll hear numbers of seven and a half eight and then I'll ask them two weeks into working at the store and say, where do you think your knowledge is at now? And they will say two and a half to three, because all of a sudden they realize there are so many more elements to our sport that they were completely unaware of. Um, you know, the guy that might be a standard big game hunter has no idea what IPSC is or precision rimfire target stuff. And, and when they learn the vastness of those sports and they find out the details of it, they're fascinated by it. 
And on the flip side, the guys that come into the sport, like you said, for personal protection or for uh, indoor shooting reasons, and then all of a sudden they find out about, uh, you know, traditional sports like single action shooting society and, you know, those types of competitions, they, they're quite surprised at, at the people that compete in those competitions. And uh, yeah, it's a very diverse crowd and, you know, uh, 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 all walks of life, uh, you know, there's uh, pr- people that are professional urban dwelling folks uh, all the way to very rural folks. Uh, like you said, all ages, the great thing about shooting sports, it's, it's probably unmatched as far as how long you can stay inside of our sport. Uh, maybe golf is the only one that I can really think that kind of has that same type of capture where you can have people that are 60 years old competing at a high level against people that are 22 or 23 years old. You know, you just don't see that in stuff like gymnastics. It just, you know, because of the physical nature, it can happen. So, uh, it's a very unique thing that we have uh, where we can have that type of demographic. And, you know, you'll go to club championships, you know, at a ski tournament and you'll see a, a teenage girl that's competing uh, head on against a guy that's 58 years of age and done it his whole life. And, and they're head to head competition. It's, it's quite fascinating to, to see how much uh, diversity there is in our sport. It's it's a cliche to people in the, in who, who shoot, but it's so true. And I'm thinking now, you know, my, my, political thing the diversity inclusion and e- e- in- diversity inclusion and equality and people who shoot see that every day when they're at the range for the reasons you just mentioned and all colors all religions all origins all everything and that's just something that we take for granted but it's it's it does it, it never hurts to repeat it and repeat it and repeat it now have you seen in terms of the demographic um have you? There, it, I know it's predominantly male. All the numbers I've seen suggest that it's still eighty-five to ninety percent of PAL position, possession and acquisition license holders are males. Uh, but are you seeing any kind of change in in buyers or people who are interested in in, in guns? Absolutely. The, one of our biggest growth markets as an industry as a whole is still the female demographic, and but we're seeing it really at the retail level now. Uh, a couple of big uh, things that we're noticing is is that. Uh, uh, first of all, from parent introductions, uh, you know, it used to be that uh, uh, a traditional Canadian family uh, that where the father hunts or shoots, he would introduce his male children into the sport, but not necessarily his female children. But we've really seen that change. And now, uh, uh, you know, those types of fathers and mothers will introduce uh, all of their children to the sport equally. And we're seeing a huge growth in female firearms. You know, when you start seeing companies like Weatherby, uh, uh, not only it, traditionally we used to see them take a, a, a standard uh, firearm that was designed for an ad, uh, adult male and then modify it for a female offering. Um, you know, they would take a, a bolt action rifle that has a standard length of pull at about 14 and a half inches and, and uh, a weight of about eight pounds. And they would just cut the barrel down and cut the stock down and say, oh, there's our ladies model or our youth model. But now we're starting to see stuff like, uh, you know, I was using the example of the Weatherby Camilla. But uh, and Savage has one out called the Lady Hunter. And we're seeing more of this where they actually take the whole gun and they scale it to the size of a smaller statured person. So the grip is smaller. The, the distance from the bolt to the to the grip is smaller and the, the grip uh, angle is steeper to allow for a smaller hand. Uh, the cheek weld is designed for a more slender face. And we're seeing all those types of things happen in the industry because the, the industry has recognized the growth of both the youth and female elements to our sport and how important it is to capture that demographic and make sure that they can come into our sport in an affordable way, but also to most enjoyable way and firearms fitting you makes it much more enjoyable to participate. So we've really seen that uh, recognition from the industry. And I think it's been fantastic. That's really interesting too. And is that something that's happened? I, I, I know it's not brand new, like it didn't just happen last year or something, but I guess the trend is accelerating. More and more companies are offering more and more models that are suited to uh, smaller, younger people. Absolutely. I, you know, it, always, like I said, when, when the, the introductions come out, there's a little bit of apprehension on, on the buyers at the dealer end and, uh, you know, to, to see, and other manufacturers to see where that goes. But all of a sudden, when they see those types of uh, markets take off, then everybody else tries to get in on it. And we're starting to see that, that uh, I think by the time... Uh, you know, 2025 rolls around, I think almost every manufacturer will have a specifically scaled firearm for a female or youth shooters uh, in, in their lineup. And they won't just be a cut down uh, adult male gun anymore. Um, you know, we've seen uh, basically the trend has been the last five years of these introductions, but we're seeing it grow and grow every year. And what's, and you've been in the industry now for, 
forever for for two, two uh, from the mid nineties to today, twenty seven years or thirty ish years coming up, and maybe even before then if you're if you got into the business. What what are you seeing today that surprises you the most, or that you really could not have seen twenty five thirty years ago? Um, on the good side, like I said, the the biggest surprise is the demographic change. Is that we we're seeing a, our sport become a lot more inclusionary. Uh, you know, it's it, that, you know, there isn't that scoffing at new shooters and that scoffing at uh, a lady that might show up to the range or a young kid that doesn't understand what he's doing. We're seeing a lot more inclusionary where the, those older shooters take that person under their wing and really teach them our sport. So that's on the good side. On the bad side is, is a little bit of the ignorance of other aspects of the sport and at the division. And that's what's still, it's getting better, I think all the time, but it's still frustrating to me sitting in this chair that you might have a, a, you know, a shotgunner that comes into the store and, and he hears something about a potential handgun ban or, you know, uh, the AR-15 rifle ban. And you hear that, that sports shooter say, wow, that's good. You know, that there's no need for any of us to have that stuff anyways. And it still happens and it's still very frustrating. And you try to educate that person, you know, if anybody ever wants to uh, think in the future and think of, I want to keep my, my sporting shotgun, the person that they should defend the most is the guy that has the AR-15 or the handgun. Because if that is, uh, if that person's allowed to keep that firearm, the chance of them coming after that standard uh, higher volume sporting item is a lot less. So you should really ferociously defend the people that have other stuff and come together as united rather than trying to divide it. Um, and the best example I can give to that is I've been to so many of these conferences and, and, and debated uh, firearms uh, policy against people in the anti-firearms community, like the Coalition for Gun Control and uh, Poly Suvienne and these types of organizations. And you got to remember that these people are paid lobbyists. The people that are lobbying on behalf of the industry, like myself, are volunteers. So we're there because we love the sport and because we have a, a skin in the game as far as a, in our business. But the people that are there on behalf of these other ones are paid lobbyists. They actually make a living going to Ottawa and fighting for further gun control. So if you think about it, if they get all the AR-15s off the street and that's what they say they want, or they get all the handguns off the street, are they going to stop at that point because uh, their, their, their job is over and then they go back to pouring coffee at Tim Hortons? That is not the case. You know that they're going to want to retain that job. So all they're going to go is to the next demographic of where they can go. And you got to remember that, that these people will not stop until every firearm is out of the hands of every Canadian. And that's why it's so important if you are a, a sports shooter that does not necessarily uh, like handgunning or, or uh, own handguns, that you must ferociously defend the rights of that person to own a handgun. And therefore, uh, down the road, that, that handgunner will support you when the government comes after you. Well said. It just yeah, really such an and I guess when you when you when someone walks into your store and, and says they're, they're taking away this and that model, good riddance. Do you do you take like are they open to you talking to them for a few minutes and, and saying what you just said? Uh, when you put it to them that way, I find the conversation changes. Uh, you know, um, I, a lot of times uh, guys will get very aggressive and get very angry, and it's a natural thing because you have somebody that you think is a a brethren in your sport that's attacking you now and that tends to cause division. But if you can just take a calm, deep breath and try to explain to them that we're not saying you have to become a handgunner or that you have to go out and buy an AR-15. That's not what we're saying at all, but you have to respect the person that does that and that they're not a demon. They're a licensed individual, the same as you. And because you may not like the look of it, or, and in that case, mostly because you're ignorant of what the mechanical capabilities of that item are. It doesn't mean you have to necessarily join that that sport or that that facet of our sport, but you still must respect and and uh, defend that person's right to have it because it's just as important as yours. And I I, I know we the, the car analogy drives everybody nuts, and I keep using it. It would be sort of like pickup drivers saying that, or or. Uh, pickup drivers saying that someone who owns a sedan is 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 bad or or someone who owns a sedan saying someone who owns a pickup is is a bad person or it's a bad vehicle and it's without recognizing that yeah a, a mini is really good for the city and a pickup is really good for different like basically all these things are legitimate uses that are owned by by good people doing good things and each each tool has a legitimate use that's it and and the the government has used firearms as a wedge issue you know 
when I had a chance to go door to door last election campaign federally, and when you knock on people's door, the, the one of the most common threads you always hear is, well, all politicians are the same. It doesn't matter what I do, who I vote for, they're all the same. And you'll hear that all over the place when you talk to Canadians politically. So therefore, the, the political parties try to find wedge issues, issues that they think they can win on, because on uh, 90% of the issues are on common ground. So they try to find these wedge issues. And firearms are a great wedge issue right now. Uh, you know, you're seeing it in every election campaign. And obviously, our, our current federal liberals believe they can win on it all the time. So naturally, at a wedge issue, they try to drive a wedge inside the sport as well. They try to, you know, hey, if we can get one gun owner to, to come on, uh, you know, online and say, hey, I'm a regular hunter and I see no need for anyone to use an AR-15. They believe that that individual is a great weapon for their war on firearms owners. And that's why the, the key for everyone that, that is trying to uh, uh, educate is to take that person down and sit down and educate them about, you know, that type of firearm in our sport or on handgunning or whatever, because we don't want those wedge individuals to not be educated. I mean, once you get the chance to educate somebody, they realize that that AR-15 rifle is exactly the same as, as Tom's gun that he brings to the hunt camp as a 7400 uh, hunting rifle. It just looks a little different because of the plastic uh, uh, accoutrements on the gun, but it, it mechanically is the same item. And once you can do that, uh, I find that it's, it works a lot better. So the key is to keep your calm and to have a, a rational discussion and to educate people. And, and I'm again, calling out in case there's any journalists or newbies watching this far into the video. Yeah. Go and go and visit your local gun shop. It's, it's, you, per, it's anybody can go and visit a gun store and ask questions or go, go and visit your, your local range. Or if you're a journalist, call, visit, like it's, it's, we, nobody's going to bite your head off. And we love to talk about this stuff. Let's, um, I want to get to, uh, to the, the regulatory, the technical consultation that is topical at the moment. But just before we do that, can we spend a minute on this CANPAR, the, the CANPAR Loomis thing? I want to get that back up on screen here. I'm just switched. Yeah, this was from last May. CANPAR Loomis stopped shipping guns and ammo. It was a surprise. It happened sort of like stores found out all of a sudden that these two major shippers had just stopped as a policy shipping ammo, sh shipping guns and ammo, especially, and that's especially a concern to rural areas and CSAAA got involved. Can you give an update on, on this situation? Yes. Um, it, it's a very concerning situation and it's something that has uh, uh, engulfed a lot of the CSAAA's time. And um, so the one thing about Canada that, that you kind of have to take a step back and understand is that because of the vastness and the rural nature of our country, is that uh, it's very difficult to deliver products to those outlying areas in a profitable manner. Uh, and therefore, all of the big courier companies that you see uh, will outsource the actual delivery in outlying areas. So, for example, a Campar, a Loomis, a UPS, uh, any of those companies, you may be in downtown Toronto and you bring your local firearm to that depot and you drop it off to be shipped. And you're shipping it to a guy in Goose Bay, Labrador, and that person that receives it uh, gets it delivered by a, a Canada Post truck. And people don't understand that the nature of how that works. And what it is, is that these companies have contracts all, uh, you know, it's very ancestral. They all kind of deal with each other. And, you, you know, the, in, in certain areas of, like I said, Goose Bay, Labrador, all the parcels are delivered by Canada Post, no matter what company they're actually shipped with. So one of the biggest problems we ran into as an industry was that, um, the, the there was a couple of incidents that came to light and it was inside of the um, the Canada Post system where uh, Canada Post was delivering firearms and, and, and in this case much more often ammunition and they're not licensed to ship ammunition because they lose they use a lot of commercial aircraft that can, uh, that are not licensed to have ammunition on them and then they were finding out that well Canada Post doesn't ship ammunition how is this stuff ending up in the hull of these aircrafts and one of the biggest reasons they found out was that it was being shipped by Campar but Campar, in turn, was delivering this stuff to Canada Post. Of course, there's no requirement for them to notify them what's in the box. And in a lot of cases, Campar doesn't know what's in the box. And therefore, there was ammunition illegally being shipped uh, via Canada Post. So once Campar uh, had a few of these incidents brought to light, they were, of course, very concerned about the liability going forward. And it happened to come at the worst time when, when uh, because of the pandemic, uh, shipping numbers were up across the country like massively like 
you know, all the online commerce was through the roof because of the closures of the stores. So they were in no way, shape or form ability to had the ability to, to hinge and to fix the issues. So it was just a lot easier to say, Hey, we're not shipping this uh, commodity anymore because it's too risky because of our business model. And that's the same reason that we've had such a difficult time bringing other carriers on board with us. Uh, you know, UPS uh, uses in many, many areas uh, of, of northern and rural uh, Canada, they use uh, subsidiaries to do their deliveries. You know, for example, in Northern Ontario, they use a company called Manitoulin Transport to do a lot of their deliveries. And Manitoulin does not have a firearms or an ammunition license. So therefore, it's very difficult for UPS to take on this commodity. What they have done is they, they extended an olive branch and said, look, we will allow any uh, company to ship firearms and ammunition with us, but only to what they call brown truck zones. And those are areas that UPS exclusively delivers, which is mostly urban Canada. Um, and this is now why you're seeing guys go on websites like ours or, or any of the large websites across Canada. And they go to click on shipping and then they find out that the shipping is not an option. And they, they call us to find out why. And we tell them that there is no legal way for us to get ammunition to Atacokan, Ontario, or wherever this rural area may be. And the reason for that is because there's no brown truck service and UPS is one of our few partners that will carry. So what we've done at the CSAAA is we've really lobbied hard with Canada Post to get Canada Post on board with shipping ammunition. It's become a, a, a thing that we've lobbied hard with. We got stonewalled by the Union of Canada Post. They, they believe that this is an inherent danger to their drivers and the people working in their sorting depots. And we've done a, a great deal of work and effort to try to educate them that it's not a danger. We even got the UN to change the designation from small quantities of ammunition to large. So therefore, they're trying to get Canada Post to be allowed to carry the small quantities of ammunition. And we're still in the process of doing that. The problem is, is that right now we're just, we have, because of the way government's operating, it's very difficult to get anything done. Uh, all of the government sessions are re operating remotely and everything moves so slowly uh, that we have not got a chance to get Canada Post to, uh, to adopt some of the principles, but we're, we're continuing to try hard and we're hoping that uh, uh, we'll get Canada Post on board at some point. Um, you know, all the other uh, people in the industry, you see it on message boards say, well, why don't you talk to Pure later? Or why don't you talk to this company or, uh, you know, uh, Yellow Freight and all these types of other carriers? But the truth is, is that it's not profitable to deliver to those outlying areas. So all of the companies, no matter who they are, they will use subsidiaries in those areas. So unless you get Canada Post, which is the only true natural national carrier to carry firearms and ammunition, you're not going to get national coverage. So I, I didn't appreciate how complex this is and and something I took for granted and just really it sh it shook the industry overnight because it changed overnight. It's a major change. And I'm so how if you live in Atacokan or you live in some remote part of um, of the province or, or the country, have you basically been without a ammunition for nine months? Yeah, we, we we have no lifeline to get them ammunition right now. It's it's extremely frustrating. Uh, we have to uh, ship to the nearest UPS store. And then they got to pick it up there because that's the brown truck service store. And in some situations that, uh, yeah, in rural Ontario, that might be a two hour drive. But when you start getting somebody in, in Nunavut or in Northwest Territories, it could be a 12, 14 hour drive to the nearest uh, UPS store. And uh, that's where we're getting a, a lot of concern. So we've adopted through the uh, Native Affairs Canada the uh, strategy to try to, to, to make this an issue saying that uh, in a lot of situations, uh, uh, Stephen Harper brought in a law saying that the native Canadians have the right, the treaty right to hunt and fish in Canada. And that without the, our national carrier carrying ammunition to these areas, that's actually violating their human rights or their native rights to, to, to do this. So that's what we're trying to do to get uh, Canada Post on board. Um, but it's been very difficult because it just honestly is not profitable to uh, ship to these areas. It's, it's extremely expensive to get a truck to these outlying areas. And, and I'm just reminded again, it's again, another angle on the diversity for some people going shooting is a, is a hobby you do with your, your family and, and, and friends on, on the weekend. For some people, it's a liver, it's a life or death thing. If you don't hunt, you don't eat and you, you die. Yeah. And, and similarly, if you work in the outdoors in some of those Northern areas, there are predators uh, like polar bears and stuff that you need protection from. Um, you know, if you are a, a prospector in Nunavut, 
uh, you will not find one that doesn't carry a firearm for, for their safety. Uh, uh, you know, polar bears can be mean creatures. And, and uh, if you don't have the ability to defend yourself, you, you put yourself at high risk. So uh, it's not fair to, it's not just hunting for me. It's also is for personal defense against wildlife. Very important. Thank you for yeah. clarifying that. Uh, and that what what a great update. It's I, I yeah again so so I, I'm as a guy who's you know thank you for for your advocacy and your work and it's it's interesting like I didn't I didn't know CS AAA was so involved in this. Uh, what's a way to I, I'm I'm not a member of CS AAA. Yeah. Would you, would your members be aware of all the actions you're taking? Yeah. So I mean, we obviously we update our members through newsletters and and we're in a type a time in 2022 where everything that goes out by email, every one of us receives such a volume of email nowadays that not everybody takes the time to read what they're always sent. So it's sometimes difficult to get the message out there of what you're doing. And, and we try. And, uh, you know, the one uh, disadvantage CS AAA has is that it's almost always run by volunteers. So there's a limited time element to each one of these things. And we, even though we do the work in the background, sometimes we're not very good at conveying the work we're doing to the membership. And we're trying to improve that all the time. But uh, yeah, and because of the Constitution of CS AAA, you have to be a business uh, licensed in Canada to be a member. So therefore, the membership is exclusively limited to businesses. But we do accept individual donations. And if people do uh, want to help, they are able to go on the website and to donate uh, and to help out the industry. Um, you know, the, the, the larger the industry is, the better chance it is that your shooting sport, sort, shooting sport survives. So uh, we do welcome those donations and we appreciate anyone that can help us. Yeah, absolutely. So, good important message. Um, I, I want to talk also just before we just before we end. I want to talk about this uh, consultation that was well, I'm going to call it yeah consultation that was begun last week by the Department of Public Safety Canada as part of their confiscation. It's called I've got it up on screen here. Technical consultation on the proposed program design and compensation model. This is the current step involved in the government's uh, mass co mass criminalization mass confiscation of rifles and shotguns that they began in march uh, may 1st 2021 uh, no bleh, may 1st 2020 and they're now is in short asking for business input for how to do this and they're asking businesses for help doing this in particular i'm going to fo page forward here to question number six of this questionnaire i'm just yeah question six would your business consider participating in the confiscation uh, sorry collection of newly prohibited firearms and or devices what factors would influence your decision a and wes i'd love to get your take on this because i'm thinking that what business like what business would want to participate in this and They've basically been made outlaws. What business is going to help the government take their guns and the guns of the clients? But that's my take. I'm curious to get your take. And, you know, obviously at first glance, that's what everyone's take would be. Um, you know, we, we have obviously uh, uh, all our organization and our businesses are steadfastly against the order and council. And we're, uh, we've all donated a lot of money to a lot of legal challenges to try to ensure that we are able to keep these items and that our sport continues to, uh, to grow uh, with these items involved in it. Uh, the unfortunate nature of, uh, of Canada is, is that uh, this uh, regulation was allowed to be uh, brought in by our government through order and council and in a means where there was no political discourse. There was no way for us to fight it as an industry because it was literally done with, by the stroke of a pen by a, a few members of uh, the senior part of our federal government. So in this situation, uh, it is the law of the land, and it is extremely frustrating to all of us that it is the law of the land. But the way the businesses have looked at it is, is that we don't want to assist uh, the government in going down the path of this confiscation um, unless we uh, are, have no choice. And what I mean by that is, is that right now we are fighting this legally, and we really hope that we're able to get the courts of Canada to, to strike this order and council down as being as being improper Canadian law. But in the event that that, uh, that all those challenges get heard, then, uh, you know, it's going to have to become down to uh, the survival of the industry. And, you know, we're going to, of course, recommend the concerns of most of the consumer groups, which is that any uh, store that helps the federal government implement a policy like this will be very expensive to that business through 
uh, bad press and boycotts and stuff like that. But the nature of the beast is, is that, uh, you know, these people have to rely on this industry to feed themselves and to put, uh, to keep their employees employed. So uh, there's always that concern that there may be uh, a business that sees this as an opportunity to make some money. And uh, well, we want to make sure that, that uh, we educate our members that this may be a very bad idea. We also have to be realistic and understand that uh, down the road, there may be some people in the industry that are really struggling and may see this as an opportunity to, to increase their profits. Uh, but right now, our recommendation has been to every one of the dealers to respond to that letter by saying that uh, at this point in time, we cannot participate in this program because there's a legal challenge outstanding and we don't want to compromise that legal challenge. Oh, I lost your audio there. Can you repeat that? Yeah, sorry about that. What about, th so thank you for sharing that. And, and what about just not responding? What if there was just massive silence from the industry? Well, the one thing that uh, is a little bit unique of the CSAAA as, composed, as opposed to the consumer groups is that uh, the CSAAA acknowledges that in Canada, governments are cyclical. They have been since the beginning of Confederation. And, and uh, although uh, in a lot of situations, most of our businesses would prefer to see a conservative government stay in power all the time or a more firearms friendly federal government, it just is not reality. Uh, they've been cyclical. They will continue to be cyclical. And no matter what the government of the time is, is that the firearms business must continue. We must be able to keep our employees employed. We must be able to stay profitable. So therefore, we always ask the government of the day, regardless of what their political affiliation is, to consult firearms businesses when it comes to firearms regulation and policy. Um, the unfortunate part of that uh, request is, is that when they consult on something that get, makes you squeamish or makes you uh, not like what they're consulting about, it still does require you to, as a business to put on your big boy pants and still be willing to talk about it. Uh, you know, and we've had some e extreme uh, wins in the past by having this consultation thing stay open. Uh, sometimes when regulations get brought in, even though the law itself might be something we have a large amount of disdain for, we are still able to talk to the government and to get a, uh, some compromises in the regulatory framework that still allows business to be profitable. And, you know, we've seen that uh, uh, an example of Bill C-71 and the initial introduction of the bill. Uh, it showed that there was going to be no longer any uh, mail order or any firearms allowed to be sold unless they were face to face. Uh, the industry had uh, uh, obviously a great deal of problem with that. And we were able to convey to the Ralph Goodale, the minister at the time, that there was no way we'd be able to continue uh, our industry in that facet because of the vastness of Canada. There would be no way for us to get the firearms to a lot of those outlying areas. And we were able to convince them through that consultation that that was not a policy they wanted to continue forward with. So as much as, uh, uh, you know, it's that old adage, you, you keep your friends close and your enemies closer. Sometimes uh, if you don't take the time to discuss the policy with the government at hand, you're going to end up with a, a set of regulations that you had absolutely no consultation with. And then they're completely un, we're unable to deal with the regulation once again enacted. So, uh, as much as uh, I know the consumer groups and, and most members of, of you know, the uh, CSSA, the CCFR or, or the NFA would like us to, you know, send a picture of our middle finger back to our, the federal government. Uh, I completely understand that. But unfortunately, it's just not a realistic response because we do wish and we do ask to be consulted on all regulations in the future. Uh, and if, if you ask to be consulted and then give that uh, non-response back, it does compromise the ability to be consulted in the future. So what I'm getting here is that you have to walk that uh, uh, fine balance. Yes, you have a point of view and yes, you have an opinion and a very strong opinion on certain, certain regulations and legislation. You also are showing a good faith effort to, to be part of whatever's going on in Ottawa and be part of the conversation and be, you know, you get a seat at the table, keep that seat at the table. Sometimes and that's not always easy because you have because of the the interests that you're defending, but you want to keep that seat at the table. Absolutely, we do want to keep that seat at the table, but we also want to respect our consumer groups, and we don't want to get in a situation where we are compromising uh, the 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 hundreds of thousands and even a million dollars that's being spent on legal challenges 
and uh, we respect and most of us have contributed a great deal of money to those legal challenges and we don't want to compromise anything that has to do with that. So in this situation, it's more of a, a response that says uh, we have no comment. And the main reason we have no comment is because we can't until the legal challenges are, are completely uh, settled. Uh, we don't want to compromise them. We don't want to get involved in them uh, at this point. So we're going to take a, a step back until that happens. Um, do we want to 100% guarantee that, that there will never be a business in Canada participate in the buyback? I think we can't do that at this point because we don't know all the parameters of what happens with the buyback. The, the but uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I I apologize. I was using their terminology, but uh, yeah, it, it's uh, it's yeah. obviously something that none of us are comfortable with. I mean, uh, I own AR-15s. I think most of uh, dealers and most businesses, you will find the owners uh, of them do own them. Um, but we've learned in the past that uh, when these regulations get forced down your throat, you're better to participate than to ignore. Because you can, you're able to protect the rights of your businesses through participation and same with the rights of the individuals. Uh, we had a great deal of consultation with the New Zealand Sportsmen's As Association on their uh, firearms confiscation and prohibition that they had. And uh, we learned a lot from talking to them. And, and uh, we're trying to convey those messages to our dealers as well as to the Canadian government on, uh, on you know, the, the perils of what's going to come down the road. So this is, I'm, I'm now, we could do a whole multi-hour discussion on this because you're, you're adding a lot of elements that are certainly new to me and I think would be new to a lot of people, a lot of angles that we don't see represented in, 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 in certainly the general media, even the firearm media. And I'm, I'm, I'm really thankful to you, Wes, for having shared this information and, and these insights. And I, I feel like I, just from what you said, I know we have to go, but um, I just got a much better understanding of some of the new, like it's not black and white. The situation that you're trying to deal with is not just show a picture of your middle finger. That's 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 a response, but it's not maybe the best beneficial response with with everything going on. Given, given what you have to do, no. And I think what gun owners got to ask themselves is, uh, you know, especially when it comes to the Air 15s or the restricted rifles that were involved in the prohibition. Now that because they're registered, because the, unfortunately for firearms owners, the federal government knows basically where all those firearms are. So now the question that firearms owners have to ask themselves is if we get down this road of this prohibition being deemed legal and will remain the law of the land, if you are going to participate in, in the compensation program, would you rather that you bring the firearm into a firearms friendly business like Elwood Epps or any business like that and have somebody with expertise help evaluate that firearm and ensure that you get the compensation that you deserve? Or would you rather bring it to a situation where it goes to maybe a police station or a, a, a military army base and somebody that knows nothing about firearms looks at it and doesn't recognize all of the accessorization or customization you've done to your precision rifle and, uh, and you don't get compensated for it? That's the question we got to ask ourselves. And I'm certainly not the guy sitting here saying that I want to participate because I want no part of it. Uh, just the thought makes me sick to my stomach. But at the same point in time, I think that's a question that has to be asked and a discussion that has to be had. Because um, once it's deemed to be the law of the land, uh, we have to deal with it uh, as owners and as businesses. And what's the best way to get positive firearm policy? And, you know, if there's going to be millions and millions of dollars spent on the collecting and confiscation of these items, do we want that money to be reinvested in the firearms industry and maybe be able to build uh, better models that are not prohibited and, 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 and offer more offerings and reinvest in our shooting sports and maybe build better ranges or have more youth programs. Is it better to capture that money inside of the industry or is it better to give all that money to uh, public service domains and to law enforcement programs or potentially private industry that's anti-gun? And allow them to take all that money and continue to fight against our future rights and freedoms. And that's something that I think has to have a legitimate conversation before uh, the middle finger gets sent, uh, if you understand what I'm saying. It, it, it adds a whole other angle that I think that I hadn't uh, I hadn't thought of. And I'm sure a lot of other people also hadn't at all seen it from that point of view. So, yeah, big thank you for for putting that out for, for us to consider.
No problem. And like I said, uh, I, I want to reiterate that the, the industry of Canada supports the owners, the, the gun owners rights. And uh, I mean, if you see, if anyone just talks to anybody at those consumer groups that have launched those legal challenges, they will tell you how much money the industry has kicked back into those challenges. And we are trying desperately to get that order of order and council re, uh, overturned. But at this point in time, um, we have been unable to do that. And, uh, you know, if if we are un, unable to be successful in that venture, then uh, I think it needs to have a more expanded conversation of what uh, what enforcement of that draconian regulation is. My intention is to keep my AR-15s and to have this confiscation order fail, and that's that's. I'm wishing every success to the to the people who are in court, and I'm I'm also donating to the to the challenges. Um. Wes, that'll be so. I'm gonna just end wishing you and and the industry an incredible 2022, uh, and thank you very much for joining me today and walking us through these these issues. And looking forward to having you on again soon. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure, Nicholas. You can call me anytime.